Yeah, I was working for my mother in, in her shop, which was like a dairy in Ireland, in Dublin. And I was all of about 14 at the time, I think. And, um, and my next door neighbor was a cameraman. And his name was Jim Mulkerns. God, I remember him. But he thought he was an American director and he smoked these huge, big, fat cigars and drove a big black opal car. He asked me one day if I would come on a shoot with him to carry his camera gear for him. And I agreed. And I, well, that was it. I was also playing drums in rock and roll bands at the time. And uh, I, I came into contact with a lot of film people and got training as an editor, as a film editor in the old upright movieola days. Uh, and then I moved on to Steenbeck's um, during during that time that they came into vogue. And then also um, I, I shot a lot of stuff because having had uh, some camera experience, there weren't that many people who could shoot. So when any of my mates wanted to shoot something for one of the bands or something, I'd always be the cameraman as well. So I learned both skills in parallel as a film editor and a cameraman at the same time. Yeah, well, it was actually uh, docos mainly, um, and also crewing for international companies that were coming in. Like a lot of Americans were coming into Ireland in those days, and uh, they were hiring local crew. Um, and then also we had Ardmore Studios, which was quite close to where I lived in Br in Bray and in, um, in Wicklow. And so I actually did various roles and jobs as runners and as uh, as clapper loader at Ardmore Studios. There were there were great people, great times. There was people like uh, John Houston was there at the time and John Boorman was there. There was also Alfred the Great was made by David Hemmings. David Lean came and, and I mean all those terrific uh, classic filmmakers and even though I only ever worked on second unit or pick up units lugging gear and, and doing clapper loading it was a fantastic way to learn. I was hired as an, a camera assistant uh, for a documentary unit uh, that was shooting around Ireland with an American presenter. And uh, the American presenter turned out to be my future father-in-law. His daughter was coming to Ireland to study at the university and he brought her with him on this uh, shoot. We eventually married and uh, I went to America and uh, in 1968. And I was also involved in the music industry. I also did music vids, the very early music vids for various rock bands around America and, and, and so on, which was good fun. My wife was offered a job in uh, in Wellington. She was a Russian English scholar, and uh, she was offered a, a a role down here in New Zealand um, to to teach at the university here in Victoria. And so uh, we decided to come down to New Zealand. We had a one-year-old uh, boy at the time, my son Declan, and uh, we came to New Zealand with fifteen hundred dollars in our pockets. And uh, there was no film industry here virtually in those days. And uh, I managed to uh, get uh, to find someone that I could work with, various freelance people that I worked with as a, an assistant cameraman. And uh, I did some very early work for the ABC as their kind of uh, stringer cameraman here with a reporter from the ABC in Australia who was based here, a guy called John Cribben. And we did some terrific films for the Four Corners program in Australia. And then I set up um, film editing services here. I imported a flatbed steam back from Australia and uh, brought the first 35 mil flatbed steam back into New Zealand. And I also brought in a six plate uh, 16 mil steam back. And I set up a, an independent post production company here. In order to subsidize the film work, I uh, ended up teaching some graphic design students at the Wellington Polytechnic. And they had a great school there. And um, I taught uh, film and television to, to the students and we developed a, a little mini film school there for a couple of years and we trained various graphic design students to, to learn about film and some of those people are still in the industry and went on to great success in their own fields. People like Ewan Frizzell who, who was an animator and people like Annie Collins who, who is a film editor and went on to great fame on Lord of the Rings. Uh, when I had my editing company, Film Editing Services, uh, two directors, uh, two ex-Kiwis who'd been working offshore came back uh, Jeff Dixon and Tony Williams. Tony had been in London um, working for the BBC as an editor and uh, Jeff Dixon was a cameraman in Australia and they both came back around that time which was around 1974, early 74 and they decided to get into TV commercials. Uh, Tony had been working at, uh, at Pacific Films with John O'Shea and had done some wonderful television programs, but Tony decided to get into t television commercials because people could make more money. And it was just starting to grow at that stage, the commercial scene. And um, 
they uh, they use my 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 editing uh, skills and uh, my facility. Tony uh, got a script up called uh, Solo, and um, long story short, I got offered the job of production managing it because there weren't that many people around who knew how to make a film and, and hadn't and had any idea of what all the functions and jobs were on a film. So Tony said to me one day, how would you like to production manage it? And uh, I, I thought, yeah, why not? Because when Solo uh, was made, uh, Roger Donaldson was doing his first film at the same time and so we we had no idea how we were all going to have enough crew and Roger was shooting in Auckland and we were shooting in the Wellington Wairarapa area and so uh, there was so few crew here in those days we had to train people virtually as as they went on the job um, so that that was two films two features that were made at exactly the same time and that was long before the film commission was around we we uh, got the money to make those films or uh, just by going and knocking on doors at various finance companies and used car salesmen invested in a lot of those films in those days when i first came to new zealand as a as an irish american almost coming to new zealand to try and understand the culture of new zealand i had this desperate need to understand what new zealand was about and of course I read Janet Frame and I read Morris G and Witty Ahmira and I, I read everything and anything I could get my hands on. Um, and I also read the cartoon strip in the newspaper every day. And I happened to say to someone at the time, God, this would make a great film. And they said, nah, 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 someone's already thought about that. And anyway, after about two or three months of reading the clip, I decided to ring up Murray Ball one day, and I just found his phone number through information or through a phone book or something. I rang him up and said, hey, Murray, I'm a, I'm a film producer. Uh, would you be interested in making a film about Foot Row Flats? He said, nah, nah, go away. I'm not interested. So we left it, and then I rang him again another two or three months later, and I think the second time he turned me down as well. And the third time I rang him up, I got him excited about it, and he said, oh, well, yeah, well, I'll, the next time I'm down in Wellington, we'll have lunch and we can have a talk about it. So he used to come to Wellington quite often because his publishers were independent newspapers at the time in Wellington. And so he used to come to Wellington. And so we met up and I gave him an idea that I had of how it could be structured and how the characters would work and what the relationships would be. Because I saw it as this terrific microcosm of life in New Zealand. And so we developed the story and the two of us worked away at scripts and stories and, and we got Ian Mune involved as a script editor at one stage and Jeff Murphy got involved to advise on the script. And then I met John Barnett who was a producer and who'd made Yankee Zephyr and very successful films uh, beyond reasonable doubt and, and I talked to him about it and he said oh yeah I think maybe we could get the money. No the film commission were there but they weren't interested or else like I, I must have gone to them at the time, but they didn't or weren't interested in animation. But um, I had generated some interest at independent newspapers, and they put in the early development finance for the film, and they eventually became one of the major investors in it when F Faye Richwhite were brought in to package the whole thing. When John Barnett uh, joined as a co-producer, the two of us then uh, packaged the thing, and John put all the money together, and I, I tended to stay more on the filmmaking side of things. Probably of about about three, four years it took us, but um, we couldn't do it in New Zealand because there weren't enough animators. So we uh, did it in Australia with uh, an animation director over there called Robert Schmidt, who had, I'd, I had actually been making TV commercials with. Murray was uh, very integral. Uh, he was he's, he was a co-producer. There was three producers on it, but Murray wrote the script, as as indeed did Tom Scott. They worked together, but it was originally based on Murray Ball's script. And Tom came and joined in, and and uh, at a, at about halfway through the scripting process, he was absolutely fastidious about how the characters would be animated, and so he was almost like a director in a way. He was like a co-director because the characters were his and. He was so close to them, and he was very possessive of the characters. And so I know it probably drove Robert Schmidt crazy, but the two of them worked remarkably well together. And he was Dutch. He was a Dutch director of animation working with, with Murray Ball. And it was really interesting because he knew nothing about rugby and he knew nothing about New Zealand. So it was a terrific relationship the two of them developed over the two or three years that the film was being made. The interesting thing was that it was an animation perspective as opposed to a filmmaking perspective almost in a way. The storytelling and the story was Murray's, but the actual technical animation direction, which is an incredibly technical field to, to work in, particularly in those days, there was no computers. 
Everything was hand-drawn and everything was hand-painted and it was filmed with a rostrum camera. I mean, it's very basic stuff. Uh, we released the film in 86 and I think we began in 81. It was a big endeavour and I'm amazed that we actually achieved it. And to this day, no one has made another animated feature in New Zealand.